and treatments, each of which may work in a minority of patients. And so none of them are a final answer to this disease. And even if one treatment brings around, uh, brings a patient into a full remission, we know that the mesothelioma can recur years later and will need or may need to be retreated. So patients need to be empowered at every point throughout their clinical course uh, to help navigate and control what is happening to them. Uh, partnership with your physician is central to such empowerment, no question about that, but the actual energy comes from your own knowledge of the biology of your disease, its extent and its operability, how it impacts on your prior personal medical history and any other illnesses, and knowledge of available treatments, their feasibility, their risks, their su success rates, and their benefits. So what type of disease are we talking about? Mesothelioma comes in several flavors. The epithelioid, which often causes fevers and night sweats and is the best kind to have. The mixed or biphasic type, which is worse. And the sarcomatoid type, which can cause severe chest or abdominal pain, is usually associated with limited operability and a rapid downhill course, and perhaps it's the kind that should receive more aggressive treatment earlier. So that is, it's important for patients to know the precise subtype of mesothelioma and to discuss their prognosis with a knowledgeable mesothelioma clinician who in turn is going to get input from a good pathologist. You need to review any other illnesses you may have had prior to or concurrent with the mesothelioma and how it may affect your ability to undergo treatment. Prior heart or lung disease or a heavy smoking history will affect your chances of tolerating major lung surgery. Kidney disease or liver disease will affect your ability to tolerate cisplatin or other commonly used mesothelioma chemotherapeutic drugs. And most patients with mesothelioma do have, uh, because of the age group of the disease, do have one or more comorbidities that have to be taken into consideration like this. You need to know the extent and operability of the disease. Surgery has been the mainstay of treatment if the mesothelioma is confined to the pleural membranes lining the lung on only one side of the chest and has not penetrated those membranes through the chest wall and has not invaded the diaphragm, not invaded the heart, not invaded the lung parenchyma, and not invaded the liver. If it has done any of those things, it usually is not operable. <coughs> the operations currently done are pleurectomy decortication, in which the lining membrane is stripped from the surfaces of the lung and the chest wall, leaving the lung itself intact as much as possible. And then the extrapleural pneumonectomy, in which the lung, which is sometimes functioning, is sacrificed and removed together with the lining membranes. For abdominal mesothelioma, a cytoreductive tumor debulking operation where the tumor is simply removed to the extent possible, and intraperitoneal chemotherapy is now routinely done, as shown here. If the mesothelioma is present in both the chest and the, abdom and the abdomen, surgery is usually contraindicated as standard therapy, although we are in fact doing it in selected cases as Dr. Chabot will mention tomorrow. Now, once you have learned about your disease, the first decision for newly diagnosed inoperable patients is whether to seek conventional or experimental treatment. If you choose FDA-approved 
conventional treatment. You have only one first line choice, and that is the combination of the cytotoxic drugs, Olimta or Pemetrexid and Cisplatin, given intravenously once every three weeks. This is an effective treatment which shrinks the tumor in about 40% of patients. However, almost all patients relapse after a few months. A very few may respond for a year or more. So that it is quite common for a given patient who has failed uh, Olympus cisplatin to uh, go on to receive two or three or more different chemotherapy regimens during their disease course. If they fail conventional treatment, they're offered older second-line drugs, chosen from among 10 or so, which are available off-label by prescription, are well-known, and have worked in a few patients less than one in five. If this sounds less than satisfactory, it is. It is less than satisfactory. If one chooses experimental treatment, new drugs for mesothelioma are introduced every few months. Most of them are tested, that have been tested in rigorous clinical trials have not worked, and many of them have significant side effects. We find out which are best by doing clinical trials. Volunteering for a clinical trial is, in my opinion at least, the highest form of patient activism, the highest form of patient empowerment, and the highest form of patient altruism. It's a part of the magical process by which we make new medical discoveries. I can't emphasize that enough, but it is a volunteer act. Three stages of clinical trials are being carried out depending on how far along a, a given drug is, let me move back a minute, how far along a given drug is in its development for use in patients. In the earliest stage, called a phase one or dose finding trial, we start with the belief that a novel drug may be effective against mesothelioma based on preliminary data obtained on animals or on cells in culture. But we don't know what dose to give, so we give increasing amounts of drug to three patients at a time until they exhibit toxic symptoms. Then we cut back a little on the dose so we have a near toxic dose. Once we know that dose, we move along to a phase two trial, which is often sponsored by a pharmaceutical company. And this near toxic dose is given to a group of mesothelioma patients to determine if some beneficial effect, either shrinkage or prolonged time to recurrence or prolonged overall survival, is seen in 20% of more of the patients studied, in which case we're going to go further. Even if this 20% mark is reached, it doesn't mean that the drug will turn out to be useful. It may be that the patients selected for this trial were unusually healthy or had minimal disease, and perhaps they might have done well with a lesser treatment or even with no treatment. Which leads us to the phase three trial, in which patients are assigned at random to either of two different treatments to ascertain which is better. Sometimes both patient and doctor are blinded and don't know whether they are handling the real drug or the placebo. Phase three studies require many patients numbering in the hundreds to demonstrate that one treatment is preferable. But conclusions reached in phase three trials are the most reliable guides to standardizing treatment. In mesothelioma, which is a rare disease numbering 3,000 cases yearly, I know of only two robust, interpretable, randomized phase three trials that were ever published, both chemotherapy trials, neither of which involved surgery. There was a third one in England, which is going to be robust enough. It's meant to evaluate surgical treatment, but it's still ongoing. So, Newly diagnosed patients should choose a phase three trial for their initial treatment even over FDA approved agents. However, because there are so few phase three trials going on, I recommend that your initial choice should be 
a new drug or drug combination made available in a phase two. And this is because drug companies much prefer that they test their new drugs in initially chemotherapy naive patients who have not been previously treated, which means that in order for you to get this new drug, you have to try to get it early in your course. Um, also, best not to believe everything told you by the principal investigator of these phase two trials, because as I mentioned earlier, most of these drugs do not work, but nevertheless, the ones that do work may make a very big difference in treatment, and the time to get them is early in your course. If a phase two drug is not available, I would switch back to first or second line conventional treatment that has a definite likelihood of response. And when these known drugs are ineffective, one should consider stopping all treatment at that point or volunteering, again, I emphasize the volunteer aspect of a phase one trial of a new agent as a reasonable last option. Now, the recent guidelines for the management of mesothelioma acknowledge that surgical treatment alone is not sufficient because there is always residual microscopic foci of disease invisible to the surgeon. Um, and chemotherapy is recognized now to play an important role either in securing a better response or prolonging the disease-free interval. So in considering any therapy, in particular one that involves surgery, you should always get input from a medical oncologist or radi radiation oncologist at the same time. And this usually means <clears throat> that a second opinion <clears throat> should be sought at an institution that is capable of delivering multimodality care by a team of medical radiation and surgical oncologists, all of whom should be strongly encouraged to answer all of your questions. If your surgeon or oncologist has no time to talk to you, go elsewhere immediately. Don't break this rule for anybody. In some, in some instances, organizations like MARF can refer you to other patients or caregivers for additional input about quality of life after different treatments and about coping strategies. <clears throat> Often patients are gripped by a tremendous fear-driven urge to try to completely remove the cancer once and for all, no matter what it takes. This impedes a rational decision, has to be thought through and dealt with. Sometimes the best course of action uh, and the happiest one may be non-curative palliative treatment aimed at minimizing morbidity and maximizing life quality. Even the best surgeon is able to remove only the cancer that he sees. He can do what he terms a complete resection only a minority of the time. Similarly, chemotherapy only rarely gets rid of all the cancer. Still, many patients benefit, some greatly from surgery or chemotherapy or both, in terms of prolonged time to progression and augmented quality of life. In some of our studies, we have shown that patients who have a complete response to treatment live as long as those who have an incomplete response to treatment. So the response is there. It doesn't have to be totally complete. Best to speak with and meet other patients in your age group who have undergone surgical or chemotherapy treatment months or years before you. In addition to patients of your prospective surgeon, it is also best to find and speak with patients of other surgeons through organizations like MARF. <clears throat> If you are over 75 and have slowly growing but unresectable disease and you have minimal symptoms which are progressing slowly but do not greatly interfere with activities of daily living, please keep in mind that surgery or chemotherapy may well degrade your quality of life rather than improve it. <clears throat> I believe that the role of doctors treating mesothelioma is to keep our patients fully informed so that they may function as normally as possible 
and so that we can together await the development and arrival of the definitive pill, we just take once a day, <laughs> and the disease will go away forever. Thanks.